Hello everyone, uh, especially those watching the recording and welcome to this live stream brought to you by Oxford University Press. My name's Alex and I'm joined today by Beverly McCullough. Good afternoon, Beverly. How are you doing? Hi, good, thank you. You? Yes, all good. All good. I'm joining you from my home in Oxford. This is a green screen background. This is my real bedroom. <laughs> uh, where are you joining us from, Bev? I'm also in my home just outside Oxford in a small village. This is my home behind. <laughs> <laughs> real. Um, if you are watching us live, we'd love to know where you are joining us from. We've got followers all over the world, so I'd love to see some hellos come through in the comments. But just a short introduction to myself. I'm part of the team that runs the social media channels here at Oxford University Press. Uh, if you haven't done so already, whatever platform you're joining us from, whether it's Facebook or YouTube, make sure you're connected to us, subscribe, like our pages. We're bringing you educational content five times a week, every week via Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, even Instagram. So just join us, be part of this community. In today's session, um, we'll be discovering the origin story behind the Oxford English Dictionary. If, like me, you're fascinated in how such a record has, was composed, you're in for a treat to take us on this journey back in time. There's nobody better than Beverly. Um, just going to introduce you, Beverly. She's, she's a trained archivist. She completed her archive training back in the year 2000. Uh, her first job was an, as an archivist for the Open University based in Milton Keynes here in the UK. She first moved to Oxford in 2000, 2003, working first at the Ashmolean Museum. If you ever get a chance to go there, do, it's amazing. And then she joined us here following that at Oxford University Press. So currently Beverly is working at Oxford University Press as an archivist. It's a, it's a pleasure to have, have you with us today and I'm really looking forward to your, to your session. Just gonna have a quick look at some of the comments coming in. Uh, Hello, Nam. Hello, Nina from Saudi Arabia. Keshav Joshi from Nepal. Morocco. Wow. From Russia. Nice to meet you, Ina. Dona, hello from Poland. Vietnam, I'd love to go to Vietnam. Great, Every, welcome everybody to the stream. Just just uh, briefly before I hand the session over, our moderators are gonna be working behind the scenes uh, to collect any questions that you might have or any thoughts or perspectives you might wanna offer in the comments during this session. So please do post them in the comments and stick around towards the end um, to get those questions answered. Without further ado, Beverly, over to you. Thank you, Alex. Um, he hello, everyone. Welcome to this live stream. As Alex mentioned, I'm going to talk about the history of the Oxford English Dictionary today. But I thought I'd start by looking a little bit about dictionaries in general and what we think of when we think of a dictionary. We've probably all heard uh, since we've been kids, go and look it up in the dictionary. But what does that really mean? There are so many different types of dictionaries and formats, right from... Um, probably most of us think of a monolingual dictionary, a dictionary of a particular language. So in the UK, that would be a dictionary of English. But I see that there's lots of you from different countries here today, and you'll all have dictionaries of your own languages. And they come in many different shapes and sizes, from little ones like this. This is our little Oxford English mini dictionary, almost fits in your pocket, right up to big ones like this, the Oxford Dictionary of English. Not to be confused with the Oxford English Dictionary, which is a bit confusing, but this is a, a one volume dictionary of current English that we produce. So you can see there just a couple of wide examples of different types of dictionaries. But they're not just monolingual dictionaries. There are many other types of dictionaries. I'll just run through a few that I've thought of. We have um, translation dictionaries where you translate a word from one language into another. There are etymological dictionaries where you look just at the origins of words. There are uh, dictionaries of synonyms or thesauruses where you look at like for like words. And there can be specialist and technical dictionaries that look at particular fields of language. So maybe medical dictionaries, legal dictionaries, slang dictionaries are very common. And uh, we also have dictionaries for young learners. So um, picture dictionaries, children's dictionaries, rhyming dictionaries. One lovely one that we did recently was a dictionary of Roald Dahl language because he made up a lot of, a lot of his own words in his book. So that was quite a nice dictionary to, to have a look at. And we get dictionaries for games like Scrabble and crossword dictionaries. And of course, we're doing this today for the English language teaching department and dictionaries for learners of a foreign language are also a big area as well. One that I haven't mentioned is a historical dictionary, and that's what the Oxford English Dictionary is. It's a dictionary that looks at the development of words, words and senses over a long period of time. So it's not a dictionary of current English, 
But that's not to say that it doesn't focus on present day meanings. Of course, it does look at present English, but it also looks at the history of individual words going right back to the earliest of times that we can find. And it does that through the use of quotations from printed works. And that can be any type of printed work. It can be classic literature, it can be poetry, it can be journals, articles, magazines, right down to film scripts, song lyrics, cookbooks, anywhere that a word is printed down, we can use that as evidence for the Oxford English Dictionary to show how a word's come into being and how it has changed over time. And that's what makes the OED really special, this really detailed, objective look at the English language. And I would say we're now the sort of recognised authority on the English language and we cover the history, meaning of pronunciation of many, many words. And I thought I would open it up to you guys here to, to sort of have a little guess at how many words you think are in the current version of the Oxford English Dictionary, which is the online version that we have today. So if you want to put up a few guesses, maybe, of how many words you think uh, are in the OED at the moment. And while you're doing that, I'll put up a picture of the first edition of the dictionary for you to see what it looked like. Uh, so you can see here, the dictionary started in the 1850s and it was finally completed in 1928. So we're just nearing our centenary of the 100 years since it was completed. So we'll have to have a, a big party for that. You can see it's many volumes long. The first edition of the dictionary was actually 12 volumes long. The final couple of volumes are still to be bound up in this image here. Uh, and um, after it was completed in 1928, there were several supplementary volumes that were issued over the next sort of 50 or so years. And then the first edition and the supplements were all merged together in the um, second edition in 1989, which was 20 volumes long. And that is the last printed version we have done of the dictionary. We're now working on the third edition of the dictionary and that is completely online. And we're revising the whole dictionary for the first time. So uh, if you look at the online version, some of the entries will be the, the second edition entries from 1989 and some of them will be the updated third edition entries. So let's have a little look at some of the answers for how many words. I can see we've got a couple of people who have actually got it spot on. Oh, it's the same person actually, but um, Chi Lu, yes, 600,000. That's pretty much roughly how many words are in the current version of the dictionary. And that's compared with about 300,000 that were in the second edition in 1989. So we've probably doubled the amount of words that we've, we've been defining. So well done to you for getting that right. So that's where we are today, but how did Oxford come to be involved in the, the dictionary? Well, a dictionary of the English language didn't really exist before the 17th century. There were vocabularies and lists of languages, lists of um, translations, but no real detailed list of the language, the English language. And then in 1604, a man called Robert Cordry wrote what we consider the first proper English dictionary. And it was called a table alphabetical and it contained about 3000 hard English words. But the words were so hard that it wasn't very usable for the general public. But it did pave the way for more dictionaries to emerge. And in 1656, a man called Thomas Blount produced Glossographia, which started using more ordinary English words. And many other dictionaries were produced after this time until we get to the big one in 1755, which some of you might have heard of, Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language. And we have an image of Samuel Johnson's dictionary here. It was two volumes long. This is just the first volume from A to K. Uh, it contained about 45,000 words and it used quotations for possibly one of the first times. Not as detailed as the Oxford English Dictionary does, but just a quotation to show how a word was used in a sentence. And his dictionary stayed in print for over a century. And other dictionaries again followed Samuel Johnson's. And then we get to the 1850s. In the 1850s, there was a group in London called the Philological Society, and they were interested in the history and the origin of words. And they decided that these existing dictionaries weren't really good enough. Um, they, were, they were good as far as they went, but um, Johnson, for example, tended to put a lot of his own thoughts and feelings into his definitions. He didn't always remember things quite right. So the Philological Society wanted to do a really um, good look at the English language and take this historical perspective. So that was when the Oxford English Dictionary idea began. Although it wasn't called that in the early days because it had nothing to do with Oxford for the first few years. It um, was all based in London with this philological society and it was actually called the New English Dictionary. So how is a dictionary produced, particularly in an age before computers and databases, uh, just pens and paper? It sort of blows my mind to think how they were able to produce this 12 volume work. Well, the Philological Society knew that they would need some help. They knew they couldn't do it all themselves. 
they only had a, a small number of members and they wanted to find all these quotations from all these different printed works to illustrate the dictionary. So they decided to ask for volunteers and they um, sent out notices and adverts to places where people would read books. So universities, libraries, bookshops, and asked people if they would read books for the dictionary. And people started to respond in their hundreds. And what they did was they um, wrote out what we call dictionary slips. And I can actually show you some from the archive. So if we can get rid of the, the Johnson image, you can see a bit closer. So this is um, a bundle of slips from the archive. This is the nice archival packaging that it now exists in. And if I open this up, I can show you some of the original dictionary slips that formed the, the basis of the dictionary. So these here, I can get it up, is a bundle of the dictionary slips for the words anchor to annoy. So there you can see, if I can flick through, you might be able to see some of the other images that are here. So my screen's all back to front. So, so this bundle here probably contains about two to 300 slips of paper. And I can fit about 10 to 12 bundles in an archive box. And I have about 700 boxes of these slips down in the archive store, just for the first edition of the dictionary. So you can see how many of these slips were sent in to the dictionary team. Actually, if you look closely, uh, some of the very early slips, and these are for the letter A, so these would be quite early, um, got nibbled by mice. And I think this is a great example here. You can see the little nibbles on the corner of the slips there, uh, attacked by some mice. Um, so I'll put these ones down for now. Um, you can just see that they're about the same size. They're all about a postcard size and they're all very uniform in how they're written out. And that's because um, they were sent directions on how to complete these slips when they volunteered as a reader. So that's why they're all very similar. But if I can get uh, an image of the dictionary slip actually up on the screen, I can explain to you how they were completed. So this is a dictionary slip for the word dictionary. And a reader would um, choose a book that they wanted to read or they would um, be given a book to read. And when they went through, they would find an interesting word or an interesting use of a word and they would fill out one of these slips for that word. So here we have the word dictionary. They would write the word in the top left corner, dictionary. And then the little N afterwards means that it's the noun. Not, or if it was a verb, it would be a little V. Underneath that, they would write out the details of the book. So that's the date, the title, the author and the page number so that it can be found again. So here we have 1878, R.W. Dale, who was writing a lecture on preaching and it's page 181. And you can see the editors have added little um, annotations and things where they want to correct the, the way it's been written out. And then underneath that, they would include the quotation. And this one is, a dictionary is not merely a home for living words. It is a hospital for the sick. It is a cemetery for the dead. And I think that's a really lovely quotation to sum up what a dictionary is. So that is how the slips were written out. And they were all numbered up so that um, they could be kept in the right order once the editors had decided on the, the order and the structure of the entry. But if I can just go back to the big screen, I can show you a couple of things from the, the bundle that I have here. So I don't know if you can see very easily but sometimes if there was a slip uh, a book that was going to generate a lot of slips they would pre-print out the slip so you can see here that they've um, printed out the details of the book so that the volunteer didn't have to keep writing out the same details of the book over and over again so that saved them a little bit of time and sometimes they would also cut up things from books so here you can see that they've just cut out the passage from the book that the quotation is in and they've just stuck it onto the, the slip of paper and sometimes we find really old books that have been cut up and stuck onto these slips all for for the great cause of the dictionary uh, even if it's not very good for the for the book itself well, i'll just put these slips to one side so when the slips came in, um, they would be put onto shelves in alphabetical order. And then when the editor wanted to work on that word, they would bring the slips down. They would sort them into the different senses and then they would sort them chronologically by the dates of the, the works for the quotations. And then the editors would add extra slips which contain the definitions of the words, the etymologies, the pronunciations, all the additional information. And then they would all be tied together and numbered up ready to go to the printer. And that's really how the dictionary was written through this mass reading program, a bit like an early crowdfunded project of asking the general public to help with a big, big project. And all these slips would go to the editors and they would work on them and, and complete their entries for the dictionary. So it was a massive project. As I mentioned, the uh, early involvement was from the Philological Society. Um, the first editor was a man called Herbert Coleridge, who died quite quickly into the project. The second editor was a man called Frederick Furnival. 
Uh, and together they gathered all these slips, they tried to find a publisher, they got a lot of public interest in the dictionary, but they didn't really get a lot of work done after the first sort of 10, 20 years. And the project started to, to sort of stall a bit. But Frederick Furnival is one of my favorite characters in the history of the dictionary. He was a real fun loving guy, very big on pushing sort of human rights at the time. And he was a really keen rower and he used to row up and down the Thames every day, right into his uh, 80s. And he was friends with Kenneth Graham, who is the author of The Wind in the Willows children's book, which you may have heard of. And Kenneth Graham used to watch Frederick Furnival rowing up the river every day. And that's where he came up with the idea for the water rat or ratty in The Wind in the Willows book. So Frederick Furnival has a little place in um, history of his own. So um, for, after Frederick Furnival um, gave up the project, we get to 1879 and two important things happened. So firstly, a new editor is found, a man called James Murray, and he takes over the project. And also that year, Oxford University Press agree to publish the dictionary. So the dictionary really has two start dates, 1857, when the project is first set up, and then 1879, when James Murray and OUP take over the project. So I'm going to put up an image of James Murray here so you can see what he looked like. He's surrounded by all those little slips of paper that have been sent in. And he's who we really regard as the first editor of the dictionary. So James Murray was from Scotland. He was from quite a poor upbringing and he couldn't afford to go to university, but he taught himself all sorts of different things, including a lot of different languages. And he even made up a, a couple of his own languages. Uh, he moved to London later in life and he was originally a bank manager and then a schoolmaster. And he joined the Philological Society because he was interested in words. And the story is that he was chatting with Frederick Furnival one evening at a meeting and Frederick Furnival was telling him how sort of worried he was about this dictionary. And Murray said, hmm, I'd quite like to have a go at editing that, not realising that it was going to take him the rest of his life to, to complete this work. He thought it would take him 10 years to write the entire dictionary. Uh, and he originally was doing this just in his spare time. He was still working as a schoolmaster. But he soon gave that up and uh, um, moved up to Oxford to be closer to the press, uh, moved him and his family up and um, gave up work as a schoolmaster. And you can see a picture of his family here. He had a, a wife called Ada and 11 children. And his wife, Ada, was very supportive of the project, but she didn't want her house being cluttered up with all the papers that the dictionary would involve. And she was reading through a magazine and she saw an advert for a sort of iron shed that you could put in your garden. Uh, and she thought this would make a nice workroom for her husband. So they built an iron shed in the garden in London and later in their house in Oxford when they moved up here. And uh, James Murray called it his scriptorium which made it sound very grand, but it was actually quite a cold and dark and damp place to work. Frederick Furnival called it that horrid corrugated den and the assistants used to sit with their feet in buckets of scrunched up newspaper to keep warm in the winter because it was so cold. So it wasn't the nicest place to work, but it was where the dictionary was largely written. But the children all had a role to play as well because James Murray would have all these slips coming in from uh, all the volunteer readers and the children would be paid pocket money to sort the slips into alphabetical order for him to work on. So they would do all the initial sorting and then it would go into the scriptorium ready for the, the proper assistants to work on. And actually some of the um, children did go on to be paid assistants when they were older in their adult life, particularly three of the daughters. And one of the sums went on to be a very good crossword compiler. So they must have learned quite a lot from these early years of reading and sorting all these slips out. So as I mentioned before, uh, James Murray thought it would take him 10 years to write the whole dictionary. And after five years, he was finally ready to produce the first part. And I thought I would ask you again, if you want to make some comments on how many, how, how far through the alphabet you thought he might have got in five years after um, he'd started. And bearing in mind, he thought it would take him 10 years to write the whole dictionary. Does anyone want to have a guess of how far he might have got? And um, while you have a guess about that, I will tell you about how they issued the dictionary. So the people that run the press um, knew that the public were very interested in seeing this dictionary. And uh, they knew that they would have to wait a long time for a whole volume to be ready. So they decided to issue the parts in little paperback, thin paperback parts. And then when they had a few of these ready, they would bind them up into the, the hardback volumes. So the very first part came out in 1884. And in a minute, I'll show you what it looks like. 
Uh, I'm just going to see if we've had some guesses in. So someone says S. Yeah, they said S. It's, it's not quite as far as S. But I think we have someone that might have already uh, read a bit about the history of the dictionary because you're quite right. They had only got as far as the word answer. So Caitlin, very well done. Um, they'd only finished up until the word ant. So if we can see the first fascicle, it's quite difficult to read because it's quite small, but it says part one, A to ant. So he hadn't even finished the first letter of the alphabet after five years. There was no way he was going to complete the whole dictionary in 10 years. So understandably, the people that run the press were starting to get a little bit worried about how much longer this was going to take than they thought, how much more money it was going to cost. And they invited Murray in and they had lots of discussions and negotiations. And James Murray almost resigned over the project because they didn't want him to carry on in the same way. And eventually they decided that he could carry on. But um, they wanted to appoint another editor to work on a separate section of the alphabet with his own team. And this was Henry Bradley in 1888. And then in 1901, a third editor, Charles uh, William Craigie, was brought in. And in 1914, a fourth editor, Charles Onions. So eventually there were four editors all working on different sections of the alphabet to try and speed up the process of getting the dictionary out. And that's why actually the final part of the dictionary to be published wasn't the letter Z, it was actually in the letter W because the editor for Z had already finished his part before the letter for editor for W um, finished his. So actually the letter W was the final part to be published. I can show you a little film clip now of um, actually them printing the dictionary. So there was a film made in 1925 that covered the whole process of making a book at the press from start to finish. And there's a very short clip in it that shows them printing the uh, Oxford English Dictionary. So I think we can take a little look at that now. It's only a few seconds long. So there we go. It's really nice to see the actual dictionary being printed there. You can see that they printed many pages on one large sheet and then cut them up into smaller ones. And they had to keep using an old machine because the dictionary took so long to produce that they had to keep using the machine that they'd used in the early days right through to, to the end. So that was quite interesting. Now, I mentioned that as well as James Murray and the other three editors, there were many assistants that worked with them. And one of the most famous was a man who you'll probably know, J.R.R. Tolkien, who was the author of The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. So he just finished um, uh, the First World War had come to an end and he was looking for a place to work. And he knew Oxford well because he'd studied here. So someone suggested he could work on the Oxford English Dictionary. And I can show you here one of the slips that he worked on when he was working here. Um, they were quite late in the dictionary at this stage, so he mostly worked on the letter W. So this is his draft slip for the word walrus. And you can see his various different forms of the word walrus and the sort of history of the word there. And it's really easy to tell Tolkien's handwriting in the bundles of slips because he's got such beautiful handwriting. So I thought you might like to see a little bit of Tolkien history. There were lots of volunteers, as we've mentioned, most of them from Britain, but there were some from other countries. And they also set up an American reading program later on. Uh, there were mostly men, but there were some women that contributed to the dictionary, too. Uh, two of the most notable were a pair of sisters called the Thompson sisters. And originally they started sending in slips like many other people. But Murray became very good at telling who was particularly suited to this type of work. And the Thompson sisters were two that he picked out. And he started sending them proofs of the dictionary so that they could make comments or suggestions. And they become, became really trusted advisors to James Murray. So it's nice to see that some women were involved in the, in the dictionary too. Uh, Murray wrote lots of letters in the course of his editing. Um, it's estimated he wrote about 30 to 40 letters every day. And I have lots of examples of his letters in the archive and they're all quite long. He didn't write short letters. And he wrote so much that eventually the post office agreed to build him a post box right outside his front door. So if you're ever in Oxford and you walk down the Banbury Road, you can see Murray's original house. And outside stands the red post box where he posted his letters and a blue plaque saying that he lived at the house. Unfortunately, the scriptorium was torn down many, many years ago, but um, the, the house and the post box still exist. So I just want to talk about one other contributor now who's um, become quite famous. It's a man called Dr. Minor. Some of you may have heard about Dr. Minor before. There was a book written about him called The Surgeon of Crowthorne. 
he was an American man, he was a doctor, and he worked as a surgeon in the Civil War in America. Um, partly because of what he saw in the war, he suffered a mental breakdown and he came to London to recuperate. And he used to have visions that people were trying to attack him. And one night he woke up in the middle of the night and thought someone was trying to break into his rooms. So he fled into the street and he saw a man walking away and he shot him and killed him. And it just happened to be a man walking to work, an innocent man. But uh, Dr. Minor was sent to uh, an asylum in Broadmoor for the sort of criminally insane and was, was set to live there for many, many years. And somehow, we're not quite sure how, he came across one of James Murray's appeals for the readers for the dictionary. He obviously had a lot of time on his hands being in this prison and he'd always loved books. He was a collector of old books. So he got the prison to send in all his old books and eventually they gave him a second cell to have as a sort of study or a library next to his bedroom. And he started contributing to the dictionary. And for a long time, James Murray thought he was a uh, a doctor that worked at the prison. He didn't realise he was an inmate uh, and he kept inviting him up to Oxford to visit the scriptorium and, and eventually realised that he was actually there for murder. But he was a really useful contributor to the dictionary. And if we bring up one of uh, Dr. Minor's indexes here, it's really difficult to read because he used really tiny handwriting when he was writing out these little um, indexes. So he worked in much of a different way to most people. Most people would read a book and just write out the slips as they went along, sent them all off to the dictionary for any letter of the alphabet. But Dr. Minor, when he read a book, would compile a little sort of notelet. And as he read the book, he would jot down any words he thought would be of use in an alphabetical order with a page number. And then he would store his indexes on the shelf. And when the dictionary were working on a, a word or a range of words, he could check all his indexes and pull out which words that he thought they would be of use. So he was really useful for the dictionary because he sent them exactly what they needed when they needed it. And he was a very valuable contributor, despite being in prison for murder. And a film was recently made about his story, actually, called The Professor and the Madman. Um, it was supposed to have a big um, theatrical release, but uh, there were some issues about um, uh, the production of it. So it ended up having a very small release. Um, but you might be able to track it down somewhere. So this is actually me on the film set of The Professor and the Madman over in Dublin in Ireland. Um, the film crew came to the archive to look at a lot of the documents to get a sense of what it was like writing for the dictionary. And they recreated the scriptorium in the house in Dublin that they were using for the filming. And I've obviously never seen the scriptorium, so I was able to go over and um, pretend I was James Murray sitting at his desk there um, on the film set. So it was a really nice occasion to be able to do that. And it's well worth looking at the film and you can, they really recreated the, the rooms really well, I think. So um, I thought that was a, a bit of fun. Unfortunately, James Murray didn't see the dictionary through to its completion. He died in 1915 working on the letter T and Henry Bradley also died before it was finished. So it was left to the other two editors to um, see it through to its completion in 1928. And um, then obviously, as I said, there was the supplements, the second edition and the third edition. So I'm going to move on to talk about the um, third edition now. Uh, so the current dictionary has about 60 to 70 editors working on it. Um, they're generally based in the Oxford office, or they were before the pandemic, obviously. Now they're mostly working from home. But uh, they're split into several different teams. So the major team is the revision team. As I mentioned, the third edition is actually revising the whole dictionary for the first time. So there's a big team that are working through all those entries, updating them for the modern audience. There's a team that work just on scientific words because a lot of the entries in the dictionary have a scientific background. Then there's a team that work on the new words. So obviously lots of new words come into the dictionary and there's a team dedicated to looking at those. There's a team for the etymology. So that's the origins of the words and they look specifically at the early origins. There's a team for bibliography. They look at the quotations that are used, making sure that they're all correct and, and properly cited. There's quite a new feature in the OED that means on the OED online, you can listen to the pronunciations of some words. You can have an audio file. So there's now a team for looking at the pronunciations. And we also have lots of researchers based in libraries around the world who we can go to if we need to, to do a bit of research into the history of a word. So all these teams work side by side. And then when the entries are ready, it goes to the deputy chief editor and the chief editor for what we call finalization, where they send everything off for, for going onto the online version. And that happens every three months. So I'm going to talk a bit about the revision process now. 
Uh, they started their working on the third edition in the 1980s and they decided they wanted to revise the whole dictionary um, to bring in all the modern sort of uh, evidence that's been discovered in recent years and to update everything and, and correct things that were wrong. They didn't want to start at the letter A because the first edition had taken a while to, to get into its stride and hadn't gathered as much um, information. So they decided to start at the letter M, right in the middle of the dictionary. And they also had a couple of really good words like man and make that they could tackle. And they worked alphabetically through the, the dictionary for a number of years until they got to about R or S. And then they realized that it was taking quite a long time to get through the whole dictionary. And some words really needed updating sooner than others. So they've now changed their method and they just select which words they're going to work on. And this can be through editors deciding what should be treated next. It can be through looking at what words are in the public eye at the moment, if something's really you know, taken on a new sort of fame. Uh, they look at what people are searching for on the OED online to see if those words need updating. So it's a combination of things to decide which words need to be treated. But the first thing I should say is that um, once a word is in the full on Oxford English Dictionary, it is never removed. We never take a word out of the full OED, and that's because it's a historical dictionary. So even if a word hasn't been used for two or 300 years, you can still go to the dictionary and find out what it means, even though it's not used anymore. Um, so a word will always stay in the full OED. But what will happen in revision is that we look at the, the entry and try and update it for the modern people. So the first thing we do is look at the quotations. We try and go back any earlier with the quotations than we can. So James Murray did a really good job of trying to get the earliest quotation, but obviously now we have a lot more electronic resources that we can use and a lot more evidence, and we do manage to antedate some of the quotations. We also obviously bring the quotations up to the present day where we can, just rounding out the history of the word. We also look at the origins of the words and check the order is still right. So if um, if we find earlier quotations, it might mean that the order of the entry changes. So if sense two now has an earlier quotation, it might jump ahead of sense one and you have to move it all around. So, so all that goes on in revision as well. And then we look at the definition text for a word. So this is the bit which explains what the word means. And in the first edition, some of the language can be very old fashioned. It's quite Oxford and British centric. So we're trying to bring that all sort of more up to date. So, for example, if it talks about the universities, it means Oxford and Cambridge, which doesn't really relate today. Um, it talks about professions as a man who does something but doesn't talk about a woman. Um, it talks about um, countries that might not exist anymore or geographical areas that might not exist. And there's also terminology used that we wouldn't use today. So back in the first edition, it was sort of acceptable to call people with learning difficulties an idiot or a lunatic, which obviously we wouldn't do nowadays. So if anything like that is in the definition text, it has to be changed to a, a more suitable explanation. That's not to say we don't take the word idiot or lunatic out of the dictionary. I mean, as I say, it still stays as a head word to explain why it's used in that way, but we wouldn't use it in the defining text. And that means that we do have controversial words in the dictionary. Um, that's because we are a descriptive dictionary, not a prescriptive dictionary. A prescriptive dictionary is one that tells you how you should use the language. It says what is right and what is wrong. But a descriptive dictionary, such as the OED, is one that tells you how the language is being used and reflects people's usage. Even if that means including a word that technically is not right in a grammatical sense anymore, but, but that's how people have started to use it, we will still use it to show that that is how people are now saying that word. And it does also mean that we, we include uh, offensive or derogatory terms, not to be controversial, but just to show that these words are being used by people in society. And if someone hears a word, they might want to, to look that up to see what it means. So we have to capture all the language. And that's what being a descriptive dictionary really means. So I'll move on to the new words now. How is a new word added into the dictionary? Well, the first thing to say is that a new word is, is not necessarily a newly invented word. It could be a word that's been around for a long time, but it's just never made it into the dictionary before. And as an example, I'll talk about the phrase OMG. I'm sure many of you heard of the, the phrase OMG, oh my God. You might think that that's a very recent term. It actually made it into the dictionary in 2011. But the evidence has gone right back to 1917 in a letter from a British admiral to Winston Churchill, who was at the time the Minister of Munitions. 
And uh, he wrote in this letter, OMG, and then in brackets, oh my God. So it's the first example we can find of, of the use of OMG in that way. So it shows you that a new word doesn't have to be a, a completely new word. It, it can have a, a you know decades of, of history behind it, but it just hasn't made it into the dictionary before. And because a word is never taken out of the OED, the editors like to be quite strict about what they put in. And that's because it has to stay in for, for the full life cycle of the OED. So they like to have a real uh, good body of evidence for a word before they'll put it in. And that means having it in several different sources, having it over a decent amount of time. It obviously varies for the word because some words will get a lot of currency very quickly and, and build up a lot of evidence, whereas other words are more of a slow burn and take several years to, to generate evidence. So it, it, you can't say exactly how many years you need, need it to have been around. But we accumulate evidence into what we call a watch list which is a sort of database of words that we're considering for inclusion and the evidence that we have for those words. And we monitor those watch lists and we um, get information from editors, members of the public. We still have reading programs, much like they did in the first edition. We still have people who read books and, and works for us and suggest new words or new usages of words. And we search databases and online resources to find examples of words. And all these things contribute to this watch list so we can see what words are really you know, um, coming into the limelight and um, have generated a lot of evidence. And once they've selected a word for inclusion, the editors will then do all the research and draft the entry uh, before it gets added into the dictionary. And if you want to add a new word yourself, um, you can go to the OED online. Um, if you want to have full access to the OED online, you have to pay for a, a personal subscription, or, although most libraries and universities will have access. But there are several pages on the OED online that you can get to without having the, the, the personal subscription and all about the history and the um, information about the general dictionary. And there's a page um, for submitting information. So if you have a new word that you think you'd like to be added or an earlier quotation that you think should be used or you see an error in the dictionary, you can send it all through this submission form and um, the, the editors will pick it up. And you can also keep an eye on our appeals lists, which are lists that we like um, suggest uh, things that we might want more information about. And we had appeal lists right back in the first edition. The editors would send out lists of words that they needed more help with. And um, we still have appeal lists today on different themes that we're looking to, to research. So do take a look at the appeals lists if you're interested in what we're, we're researching at the moment. And you might get something in the dictionary. So that's about all I wanted to talk about today. So I'm happy to have any questions. I think we've had a, a couple coming through. So oh, Alex, I think you're on mute. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> the classic. Yeah, it's my fault, sorry. Yeah, we do, we do have some time for a couple of questions. Uh, if you'll be happy to take some. Yeah, we'll... sure. Great, yeah. So we had one from Duc Vaudoy. Uh, could you please tell me where I can find the origins of all words in the dictionary? It's an interesting one. So, so if you look at the OED, lots of dictionaries don't have the historical detail that the full Oxford English Dictionary does. So if you look at this, this one here that I showed you at the start, this is just current English, so you won't have all the origin detail in something like this. But in the full OED, you will get all the origins and all the, all those quotations that I've been talking about. So you really need to go to the full Oxford English Dictionary for all that. But as I said, you can um, either pay for a personal subscription for the online version, or you most universities and libraries um, have access to the OED now, so you could go and have a look at it online. Or some of them might also have the, the old second edition in the 20 volumes that you could go and look at. And you should just be able to find every word that's in there has a, a whole string of data quotations from the earliest evidence they can find right through to the present day. Like I said, it's only really done in the sort of the big historical dictionaries. Yeah. Great. We'll, we'll try and add some links to the comments to, to some of those resources that we can find online for you as well, guys. Uh, we do have another question from Pudderbind Bahira. Um, can we learn grammar using the dictionary? Um, it's not a grammatical dictionary. So, I mean, it will tell you, um, it will give you information on the pronunciations and the different variant forms, but it's not strictly um, going to tell you the, the grammatical information. I think there are other dictionaries that might do that sort of grammatical dictionaries that are better for that, but it's it's more just a defining dictionary with, with detailed information. Great. 
who are ju just to step in we do also have some fantastic dictionary uh, resources here at oxford university press if you want to start using dictionaries as part of your teaching or your language learning journey uh first one is the we do have the full written history of the oxford english dictionary and that is available free online right now and it does actually go through some of the uh content that beverly's uh, talked us through today. So we can make sure we get a link in the comments uh, to that for you. It's really interactive, it's fun to use, so do go check it out. Also, if you're learning English and you want to make use of a dictionary, the Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionary is a really good place to start. You can start searching words right away. You can hear spoken examples, associated idioms, phrasal verbs, syn synonyms. You can build your own word lists. It's it's got everything. So we'll add a link in the comments uh, to that as well. And of course, there is a premium subscription for uh, OALD Premium 2, which has some added benefits as well. Our third resource for this session is Lexico. Uh, it's a free online dictionary and it actually uses data from the Oxford English Dictionary. So we'll add a link in the comments for you to go check that out as well. So start searching words on there. Um, and something that we've mentioned throughout this session just as people did 100 years ago, you can submit words to the dictionary for consideration by the dictionary team. And uh, we have a link in the comments if you'd like to have a play around with that and uh, submit, submit some words. Uh, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Beverly for joining us today. And I'd like to you know, extend a, a, an enormous thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, we've been reading your comments in the background whilst Beverly's been talking. We've loved them. It's great to see you guys all so engaged. If you have really enjoyed this session, please do leave a like. If you've loved the session, leave a love. Uh, if you can't find the button to do that, just leave us some love in the comments. We'd love to see it. Uh, if you know somebody that might find this session useful or interesting please do share it with them and uh yeah you can tag them in the comments to do that it really does help us out make sure these streams are reaching as many people as 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 possible um again thank you beverly for joining us this session's been really really interesting um and thanks everyone for joining have a great week all